We're going to kick off the session with a keynote which comes to us from Matteo Carboni. Now, Matteo is the founder and director of the IoT Insurance Observatory, and he's going to be looking at how IoT is transforming the claims journey by lowering loss rations, engaging policyholders, and helping to create a safer world. What he's trying to do is to address the bigger question. Am I right in saying that? Is the promise of IoT finally being realised? Yes. OK, well, I'm going to show you why. <laughs> yes, you're going to show me why. So can you applaud him? Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to sit around here so that I can hand the floor to you and watch you in action, answering that big question. Thanks, and feel free to jump in with your questions. Thank you Happy to take much. them. <laughs> so, good morning to everyone. Um, I would like uh, to open my discussion with you about uh, the usage of IoT on the claim management process with uh, your worst nightmare. Sorry, can you go back one slide? Because it's too sensitive, this. <laughs> so, a few months ago, in the sector, everybody in each meeting was talking only about uh, this statement. Tesla came out saying uh, they would like to transform a nightmare in a dream. They would like to transform, to reinvent uh, the claim experience. Well, basically, what they are doing is that uh, uh, you have their app, uh, their sensors inside the car detect automatically that something happened. They contact proactively you through the app, uh, and they ask you to upload photo, to add uh, all the information that are necessary to manage the claim. This is scaring you, I know. I have heard uh, uh, many of the insurers I'm working with uh, uh, asking uh, what this will mean for the insurance sector. Well, my answer has been uh, that uh, telematics is not something uh, only Tesla is doing. Telematics is something incumbents are doing pretty well. Uh, until a few years ago, let's say 2016, uh, in the US market, uh, there was a lot of skepticism around uh, the impact of UBI. Now, you, after pandemic, we had uh, a few statements uh, that uh, add pressure to any auto insurer in the market. Uh, all state uh, have shared how they are doing well with uh, the usage of telematics data. A player as Geico that have denied UBI for years uh, admitted that uh, now they are investing on it in order to close the gap. So today in the US market, uh, telematics is recognized as a necessary capability for any auto insurer. You can be even a, a regional carrier, but you need, you will need to use this data in order to survive. But you can do more than surviving. So when we talk about telematics, uh, we talk about something that detect the G-forces. So there is, there is an accelerometer inside uh, an OBD dangle, but even inside uh, the phone uh, that detect any G-force. So G-forces has been used for years uh, to evaluate the driving behavior, speeding, cordering, uh, are braking. Well, these accelerometers used well, uh, so with uh, uh, an algorithm that is tailored to detect claims, to detect the dynamic of an impact, can be precious to do exactly the things that Tesla declared. So my goal during the next 15 minutes is to show you that you can do exactly the same that has been done by Tesla. And my provocation is, what are you waiting for? So, uh, sorry, again, one, one, one back. 
Mark? OK. Uh, first of all, let's look at uh, what mean to address the claim journey with uh, the usage of telematics data. So any telematics solution you have decided to use, can be the phone, can be an OBD dango, can be a black box installed in the car, or the connected car data, will allow you to know real time that something happened. So first of all, you can provide assistance. I have some of the members of my think tank, the IoT Insurance Observatory, that uh, have done this for years in Europe. And uh, they have shared recently the amount of lives they have saved yearly because they are providing a proactive assistance. When they detect uh, a severe crash, uh, they dispatch an ambulance. They don't wait uh, that someone that passed through there call the assistant. Uh, but let's look at uh, the process that uh, Tesla has dropped on the table, becoming proactive uh, with the first notification of loss. Well, you can do exactly the same. You can trigger through the crash detection uh, the, the process to open the claim. And you can, through your app, uh, you have seen uh, in the distribution uh, of the volumes uh, of uh, personal auto telematics in the US, how mobile is representing large part of the growth. Uh, so through the app uh, that is detecting the driving behavior, you can uh, start a process that is exactly the same process that Tesla introduced. You have not to invent anything. I shared this slide the first time with an insurer in 2017. So it's not rocket science. Uh, many of you have two projects today. One is UBI. On the other side, uh, you have a project uh, that is uh, image recognition. Sometimes I'm telling insurers, why these two teams uh, are not working together? You are wasting an opportunity. An opportunity to create uh, the dream process that someone have dropped on the table have scared you. Well, if you are doing this, uh, so if you detect uh, the crash, if you use the telematics data and uh, you ask a few pictures, you have already collected 70% of the information about a crash. Sounds like uh, a great opportunity to create efficiency in the process, to reduce your cost. Let's see what else can be done. So you have uh, information about uh, the severity of the crash. You know which is the car. You can start to understand what parts are damaged. Uh, you can create a better experience for your policyholders. So one back. Uh, I want to be honest with you. When on a stage of a conference as this, someone is telling you that uh, telematics will create an automated process. Don't believe them. It's not true. Telematics is a fantastic tool to support a claim handler, to be more confident in, and more quick in identifying total losses. So here you don't need to do anything. You need to make a proposal to the policyholder. You can identify simple claims that can be low touch. Uh, and then you can focus the activity of your claim handlers, of the adjuster, of the inspectors, uh, on something that is more complex or even look like a fraud or an inflated claim. So this is the reality. This is what uh, the best practices around the world are doing. Not a full automation. Uh, you don't need any more claim handler. The telematics data will tell you anything. They will help. Uh, Today, the most ambitious insurers around the world, thanks to the telematics data, are trying to orchestrate really a, a new customer experience, saying, I will send you to the uh, body shop that is ready to fix uh, what is the damage of your car. If your car is drivable, I will not stop it uh, until the part that I've already ordered will, will be received. So, at the end, telematics can be used as a game changer of the current process. You can do even better than Tesla if you want. 
You don't need to invent anything. You have today, already, around the world, a few best practices that are doing pieces of the full puzzle. You can be the insurer that put together all the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, last aspect, uh, subrogation. I have seen insurers uh, using the telematics data to challenge uh, exaggerated requests, uh, to challenge uh, body injuries uh, that cannot happen with that kind of severity. So all things uh, that uh, on your income statement uh, will represent millions of savings. So here uh, I would like to quickly share uh, the KPIs of uh, the best practices uh, I have seen uh, over these years. So players that have increased the usage of their preferred body shops, players that have increased the speed of their claim process, players that challenging uh, all the exaggerated requests have been able to reduce the incidence of their body injuries by 18%. Well, the injuries is a large part of your uh, third part liability claims. Uh, I've seen players that have trained their loss adjusters on the field to use uh, uh, a report that represents them where is expected the damage. So let's think about a car that had an impact on the front right. Then uh, the adjuster that see the car on the field is uh, hearing from the policyholder that there are a few scratches on the bottom left. From the dynamic of uh, the crash registered by the, the telematics data, this is impossible. This is the kind of claim that, uh, the inflated claim that uh, you will always pay. You have no uh, factual evidences to avoid to pay even these scratches. With telematics, uh, the display have been able to raise red flags, say, no way that these scratches has been done in this crash. Was there for months, probably. So applying this approach, uh, this, there is an insurer that have lowered by 10% the material damages cost in their claim portfolio. Uh, challenging request from third parties say, oh, one month ago, you're insured, hit me. Then you go back to look at the telematics data and say, oh, the car I'm insuring, uh, the day was parked at that time. It's unlikely that I beat you. <laughs> so again, 15% uh, of reduction uh, in uh, the percentage of claims where uh, the first request uh, was uh, from a third party that was saying, you are uh, liable for creating uh, damage on me. So we are talking about uh, material impacts. Uh, if this uh, is the most advanced experience uh, in using IoT data in the claims management process, I would like to share with you a few other experiences in other business lines to nudge you that whatever is the business you are working on, if you are looking at IoT sensors for risk prevention, for pricing, well, look seriously at your claim process. Set at the table with your colleagues that work in the claim process and uh, try to understand uh, how the data collected by these sensors can help them. So exactly the same process I shared about personal auto uh, as is currently being applied for commercial auto, but even on motorbikes. There is an MGA in Italy that installed a device on the motorbike and then reinvented the claim process exactly in the same way I shared for the auto. The only difference is that the algorithm that is reconstructing the crash is completely different. The G-forces a motorbike is exposed to are completely different from a car. But uh, uh, one less. <laughs> um, I would like to share an example of uh, how sensors have been helpful on uh, the claim process uh, for general liability. So a few years ago, a broker that uh, had a portfolio of uh, uh, shops, uh, supermarkets, uh, had a here in the US, had a big issue. Uh, the owners of the supermarket was always considered uh, not doing enough to avoid injuries uh, in uh, uh, their uh, facility. Uh, so when there was a litigation after an injury, 
the jury was always saying, you have not done enough. So this broker had a problem. Insurance was not anymore underwriting this risk in that state. This broker tried to use IoT for mitigating uh, this claim problem in the litigations. So he stalled uh, buttons, so a primitive version of IoT. Then the second version has been using an app in the pocket of the employees. Uh, the track, uh, the safety wall through. So there is a log each time a safety wall through is done. So when there will be a litig if there will be a litigation, the insured can show that uh, all the scheduled safety wall through was done in the correct way. So they introduced this tool to solve a problem that they had in the claims to support the litigation. Uh, let's look at something even more uh, innovative. Uh, I'm talking about cargo insurance, uh, a specific use case for a specific product, fine wine, bottles of wine that are transported from France to the US. Each bottle costs five, ten thousand dollars. So uh, if you have a big cargo full of these uh, bottles, uh, you have a big exposure. And uh, there is one risk that was extremely difficult uh, to assess, that was possible to be identified only when someone opened the bottle. So if the bottle had been exposed to a too high or too low temperature. So what happened when uh, this uh, uh, scenario is verified? Someone has to pay. But uh, how to know in which step uh, of the journey of the bottle this happened? So an insurer a couple of years ago introduced uh, a parametric element inside the cargo coverage that cover only the risk of the temperature. So there are sensors inside the cargo, and if the temperature go above or below the threshold, mm -hmm. the insurer pay, and the wine is destroyed. So again, a specific issue on the claim process has been solved using the data that come from IoT sensors. One less. Uh, more? OK. Uh, so the usage of uh, IoT data for claims management is one of the multiple use cases that can be enabled by the usage of uh, IoT or telematics data for auto. Uh, each, sorry. Okay. Uh, each use case can contribute to build a business case. So, in many cases, uh, uh, I will discuss uh, in the next uh, uh, session on the other room, uh, risk mitigation with uh, the friend of the Atford. Uh, risk mitigation is amazing. I, I have uh, already generated great return on investment. But in many cases, uh, the cost of IoT is too high. So risk mitigation is not enough to justify the investment on IoT. Well, if you add uh, the usage of data for claims management, if you are adding a sophisticated pricing, are all elements that together can build a sustainable business case, can generate the return on investment that you are looking for. So the scenario you will have to deal with is a scenario when your clients, the enterprises that you are insuring, will be connected. As an insurer, your choice is to do something or to only be scared that players as Tesla will disrupt you. So I think that any insurer in any business line of any size should define their role in this connected world. So um, a few lessons learned working with many of the carriers that around the world uh, are on the frontier of innovation using the IoT data. Uh, don't look only at the product. All the elements of the strategy, including the distribution, need to be coherent. But uh, don't think of this uh, as a product. This is a capability. It's a capability that needs to be built uh, initiative after initiative. All the success stories uh, I mentioned at the beginning of state uh, went through six, seven years uh, of initiatives. Each initiative represents one step in their journey to develop the necessary capability. 
And I'm not talking only about the technical capability, but also the leadership capability. Because let's be honest, if you don't build a C-level support for these initiatives, uh, these initiatives will never scale. So I would like to, to thank all the, all the members of my uh, IoT Insurance Observatory, my think tank, for uh, um, the past six years uh, uh, have supported me uh, with, uh, uh, with their thoughts, with uh, um, their effort in sharing their experience. And uh, everything I, I discussed with you come from concrete experiences that some of these insurers are doing, uh, are doing around the world. Uh, if any of you uh, in the next month would like to join the journey of our think tank and learn uh, together with uh, all the insurers that you see represented in this slide uh, how to use in a profitable way IoT data in the insurance sector, feel free to reach me out. Thanks a lot uh, for the attention, and I'm here for any question. Thank you very much, Matteo Carbone. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's a fantastic presentation. We do have another presentation which will follow, but I know that you're going to be here for most of the day, and of course, okay. you've got the presentation. <laughs> I need to run in the other Exactly. Room. Yeah. So please, if you want to put any questions to him, you can do that whilst he's here, not on the stage because we have to vacate it, I'm afraid. Okay. But look, thank you Later so much. Later the question. <laughs> yeah, he's got lots to say. Thank you so much. Please do give him a round of applause because I thought that was a brilliant presentation. Okay, and more quality to follow because Really, we're going to be talking, in fact, well, rather, I'm not going to do any talking. I'm going to sit back because the lady in question is Elizabeth Del Ferro, and she is the Vice President and General Manager of Nearmap. So, really, Matteo has laid the ground. She's going to move things forward a bit because she's going to be talking about how Nearmap are actually leveraging new technologies so that they can access and gain insights from new data sets. Again, it's a huge topic, okay? And I think that we should actually give Elizabeth our time because you have got a lot to say. So can you please welcome Elizabeth Del Ferro. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much. Okay. There you go, the Thank stage you. is yours. It is always good to follow a, a presenter like Matteo, professional, polished and everything. He had his own camera set up here to, to record, but I will do my very best. So uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'm going to broaden it out a bit more than just talking about near map, but talking about remote uh, claims assessment and how you use technology to do what carriers are trying to do in terms of bringing forward a customer experience that uh, perhaps we haven't been able to deliver in the past, doing it with speed, doing it with accuracy and such. I'm going to show pictures here in order to try to keep you engaged. Um, these are from Nearmap uh, specifically, but it paints a broader picture again of the technology that's out there to be able to be used. Uh, so let me start. I did the first thing on the very first one. It is sensitive. Okay. Um, let, let me start by setting the, uh, the stage. Everybody, I'm sure, in this space, more than any other space in the world, understands disasters are on the rise uh, in terms of CAT. Uh, and the cost of CAT. I'm going to use that as a framework to talk about the impact to property and tele, uh, property, specifically property insurance, and the usage of, again, technology to help with that claims piece. So when you're looking at the rising cost, all, all the carriers that are in here understand it, absorb it, et cetera. Uh, there's also, the, obviously, behind this, the human cost. And so technology that's out there, including aerial imagery, is here to really help with enabling all of our customers, all the insurers, reinsurers, et cetera, to be able to, again, get to those customers quicker, better, faster. So I'm gonna just describe what's here on the right and then carry this theme throughout this conversation. This is on one city block. This is, you'll see at the bottom where we label exactly what happened and where uh, in terms of date and time and such. You've got one city block uh, or one neighborhood where your PIF as a carrier may have been insuring each of those. And look at the difference in devastation that happened with one not having any impact seemingly and the one to the right being a total destruction, right? Knowing this information as quickly as is possible for you to be as proactive as you can be into your own insureds and helping them along their journey is one thing. Also, I'll talk about how you can even look to more 
preventative and proactive insight and information with technologies such as aerial imagery, for example, to be able to mitigate, to be able to help at least have the conversation with uh, customers along the journey. I'm gonna just point to fire in particular, then broaden it out a little bit. Uh, fire is near and not dear to my heart. Uh, I live outside the Denver area. Um, I'll show some pictures quickly about the Marshall Fire as well in a second. But this is a great example of the continuing trending upwards. This goes to 2018. I'll show something more, more recent in a second. But more intensity, more coverage in these. It's no longer just captive in one area. If there's a wildfire, it's out there. Um, it's going to grow. It's going to grow fast. And it's going to affect a lot of acreage, whether it's in the mountains somewhere or it's in, a, in an area um, that's a wild, uh, wildfire urban interface and such. So we know this is happening. We know this is happening. This is a more recent picture by some government agencies. Just in 2021, those, uh, those I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in your way here, but uh, um, those, those uh, uh, cats that had a billion dollar or more impact across the US, so it's not, oh, it's the coastal cities, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's across the US, it's across types of perils as well. It's across the year. There is no fire season anymore. A hurricane may be a little bit more constricted still time-wise and such, but this is happening across the board. And so I moved, for example, to the Colorado area about 20 years ago thinking there's no natural disasters there. There's no hurricane, there's no, there's no uh, uh, tornadoes except from the Eastern Plain and such. Now we worry about fire, obviously. So it's, uh, it's uh, increasingly impacting a lot of the different areas. So let me bring that back down to what's the experience for anybody that's gone through a cat, and even maybe not a natural peril, but something else that happened along the way, and what's happening in, to them as they go through this, and you as insurers, how you're helping them through that journey. It's traumatic no matter what. Even if it's a roof leakage, all of a sudden you've got water in your house. It might have been caused by a tornado, might have been caused by just you've got old shingles. Something happened, there's, there's damage now. Uh, so something happened to your property uh, by an unintended or intentional driver such, or something else. The, the point of this is really that whatever is happening in some way is going to be traumatic to that carrier. And this is an opportunity for insurance uh, carriers as a whole or anybody that's touching them as service providers as well to understand that trauma that they're probably going through, recognize it, and be proactive in how to help. So we'll talk a little bit more um, about some of that journey. Uh, a lot of the words I'm using are proactive and, and helping along the journey and how to really engage in that customer experience. Everything we've been through these last couple of years um, has just accelerated all of your need to move forward with your digital experience, with the remote engagement. Everything we can do to get it is practically from an operation of a, of a remote location, whether it's food, ordering a car, whatever else. The more we can do, even through a risk uh, or through a, an assessment of a claim, that might also be done in some kind of way remotely is also uh, going to add to that. So insurers we know, not always at the top of the list of customer experience, uh, as, as, as software vendors, as the ecosystem out here to support and enable, uh, we're trying to help with that journey, certainly uh, by giving more and more tools. And part of that, is actually helping you to figure out how you utilize technology again, like aerial imagery, to go through that journey. So let's talk a little bit about um, something happens, there's a catastrophe. Again, I'm going to use that just for the exaggerated uh, scope of things. If something happens, you're mobilizing your triage, you're mobilizing your resources, et cetera. Having access to something that tells you, imagery that tells you right away, what happened? What did that look like? Where is my PIF impacted? What's the measure of the destruction? That's something that can bring forward, um, I'm gonna go back a second, that's gonna be, bring forward part of uh, um, helping you to be able to help your clients much faster. So here's an example. This is a picture outside of Arkansas, April 2021, lovely neighborhood, um, and uh, all is calm. The next thing is, uh, the next picture, a year later, that same, uh, that same housing area. You know right away to be able to reach out 
to your customers and be able to understand and appreciate this is what happened to their home overnight or during the course of the day or such. How have you set yourselves up through having this kind of, of technology quickly, within hours, within maybe a day, to be able to actually triage and send resources out. Maybe you don't need to actually bring people to, on the ground there because you see it's actually, there's nothing left. Mobilize your resources to areas where there actually are some homes that just need some kind of additional or different kind of help perhaps, right? Helps you to make some decisions helps you assess what you're going to do to actually uh, help, uh, help uh, um, along that claims journey. So this on the left side, uh, this on the right side, just within a month's time period, I'll go into another picture that shows a little bit more. Got to go back a second, this really is. Um, again, this is a before, one month before Terminado. This is commercial property. So we've been talking about houses, uh, but did not get to, uh, didn't insert commercial property. Maybe it's a school, maybe it's a, uh, a shopping center, something that also tells you uh, what did it look like before? What was damage around there? What, what, uh, what, it, what was that layout? And then again, what happened afterward? What's going to be the total cost of destruction? So I'll talk about the underwriting side in a second, but I've been focusing on the claim side, again, on that customer experience to help when something actually happens and to help set yourselves up in terms of actually being proactive uh, and being ready to, to, to address what needs to be done. Then comes the actual time where, okay, you've touched, you've reached out to your insurer, you actually need to maybe start very quickly with remote assessment of, 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 of the uh, actual work to be done. How can you do that remotely as well? More and more of our insurers are telling us, look, we want to only send somebody to actually on the roof in very, very minor situations if something can't be done through a picture to tell us what's going on. How can we enable, again, through some technology, um, that outside view, and there's a lot of super, super uh, good technology that actually helps on the inside of the house too. Clearly, we're focused here on the outside of it as well. So uh, this is, this is uh, as you can see, after a tornado that happened uh, just last year outside of New Jersey, um, if you're assessing claims right away, more and more of the impact is showing you, look, this is a total write-off. How do you do your own estimation internally to know here's our claims loss because this is going to be uh, based on the strength of these tornadoes and actual total loss that comes through? But more so, then you start to be part of that claimant's journey. This is a, 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 a showcase of what's happening over time as they rebuild. And are they rebuilding to what you actually are compensating them for in terms of, 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 of the policy that they had with you? Are they putting in and, and uh, recovering in the way that you would have hoped? On the, in the middle one, you've got just some damage with some tarps on top. Um, on the left side, it seems like they're bo both going at about the same pace. If we go to the next one, um, we're going to be a little bit... Uh, can we go back? Sorry, I said the next one. And then... Um, Sorry about that. I think I had one in between. Oh, here we go. Um, we're, we're, we're showcasing a journey. I'm sorry, can you go back? This is, I'm gonna just throw this out. <laughs> um, so you're showcasing the journey and we're able to follow them because this was February. We'll fly over again, for example, in a couple of months or we've maybe already captured it to watch that journey as they're going to be able to see are they on time, are they on schedule? How can you again as the insurer actually be working with them and touching them along the way and not just issuing a check to say, okay, you took care of that, it's all done, but you're actually seeing what they're going through and living through it and such like that, okay? So a lot of head nodding because you've had to, to, to undoubtedly work with customers along the way and your insureds along the way that have lived through this. I've showed you some of the more drastic side of things, but it's also the sides where you actually are able to get in there and help your insureds along their, their trauma and along their journey. Let me flip over very quickly to what this can look like, not only on the claim side, but also up front through the underwriting, through the estimation of what, uh, what uh, your own book of business should be looking like and such. Um, let's take an example of what's happened during the pandemic. We've got uh, some studies that we've done of looking at one specific carrier uh, that we work with, about uh, 1.6 million um, of their homes that are covered outside the California area. And they asked us, help us understand how many new pools were installed or, or, or built during, during the pandemic came out about 70,000. 
of outside of California, 1.6 million homes, 70,000 pools. How many of those might have been added to that insurance policy, for example? Uh, we don't know that. They're, they're figuring that out on their own, but that's something that they can go in not only to make sure that they've right-sized their own uh, risks and, and uh, portfolio, but also, again, to engage with the customer, engage with the insured to be able to say, hey, you need to make sure you're covered. We see that you've actually added a pool and you don't have liability coverage for that. You don't have anything. Let's make sure you've got what you need, for example. Um, a couple last pictures for you to show uh, this is uh, under insurance and coverage risk, as the title suggests. I uh, want to show the evolution of, uh, of two homes that went from 2014 uh, to the next, pay, uh, next time we've captured along the way, but this is a seven-year difference. If you see those two homes that I just showed, drastically different, drastically different. Yes, there might have been a pool before, but there's different pools now. There's tennis courts. How was that insurance actually uh, upscaled to be able to actually reflect what's here today for your own portfolios and again for the customer and for the insureds themselves. 80% of those that were impacted by the Marshall Fire um, in Colorado were underinsured. Lovely neighborhoods, well, neighborhoods a little bit maybe a little downscale from this, but 80% underinsured because either the insurers weren't keeping up with the policies and making sure they were um, as, as uh, updated as needed, and certainly the insurers themselves. Last thing I'll go through really quickly is the usage of additional technology along with the imagery uh, in terms of really being able to update those PIFs and being able to identify what's changed and what's different uh, within the property and the, and the portfolio that you might have. This is where AI um, and, and uh, really enters in. Same picture that I just showed a second ago. You start to apply uh, AI attributes to what you've seen. You're starting to be able to identify different spots. You're able to identify, I'm gonna fly through this a little bit, um, different attributes that you can bring to life through looking at this. What does the tree coverage look like? Mm. Are, is there a pool there? Are there older shingles there? The technology around AI that we and other, uh, par a lot of our partners bring forward help you as insureds uh, to actually be able to work with your own insureds and, and, and ensure that they've got the coverage that they need. So close with this, yes, for sure, on claims and everything I walk through on that also in mitigating risk for all of you, as well as the opportunity on both sides of this to really engage and work with your insureds through their customer experience. I'm gonna leave it at that, because I know time is short, we're trying to catch up a little bit, uh, but certainly around to answer any questions and such. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth Del Ferro. Great presentation. Thank you. We got the pictures we've got here, that's great. That really was a fabulous presentation. You can see there the line of continuity following on from what we heard before from Matteo. And now just digging a little bit deeper, some of the considerations you have to take into account when you're making these assessments. But let's keep the theme going because what we're going to focus on now is automation in claims. In other words, understanding the keys to success, driving new efficiencies, and of course, asking if automation is always the answer. I don't know that but I know some people who can. Could you please give a very warm welcome to our panel speakers? First up, we've got Jake Sloan. Jake, come and join me on the stage. Jake, where are you? Jake, where are you? Oh, it's, I beg your pardon, is he remote? He's there. Yeah. Jake, Jake, why are you shy? <laughs> Oh, there's a slight mistake, but look, whoever you are, you're gonna introduce yourself. Please do give him a round of applause. It's good to see you. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you all, yeah, not Jake Sham. Yeah, <laughs> you know what, it, it doesn't really matter, you're not a disappointment, just take a seat. <laughs> you're never going to be disappointed here, Sham, it's great to see you. <laughs> okay, Benku Thomas, I've met him earlier, so I know that this is Benku. Come on, applaud! <laughs> Welcome him! <laughs> It is a big deal coming up onto this stage. It's nice to have applause because it's very supportive. It makes everybody feel welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here, Benku. And come on, extend the love to Laurie Pierman. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Laurie. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, that's great. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Okay, so what we do, before we actually get into the heart of the discussion, it's a chance for you guys to introduce yourself to the audience. So, Sham, can I speak, start with you, please? If you can just tell the audience what it is you do and for whom, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. So, thanks for having me here. 
Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I think it's good afternoon now. Yeah, it's afternoon. <laughs> so I, uh, I am Sham Samani, Insurance Solutions Owner at Appian Corporation. Uh, Appian is a unified local automation platform, and I manage the, the existing Appian Insurance Solutions and also look for the next best use case to build an insurance industry solution on, on the local platform. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Benku Thomas. I am the um, <clears throat> uh, Global uh, Chief Architect for Claims at, uh, at Chubb Insurance. Um, and um, my, my team of architects and myself work closely with the claims business uh, to develop new technology solutions. Um, our okay, fantastic. And Laurie? Hi, I'm Laurie Pierman. I'm Vice President of Claim Operations at AmeriShare Insurance. We're a commercial property casualty carrier based out of the suburbs of Detroit. And in my role, I spend a considerable amount of time looking for technology and solutions that can help our claims team either provide better service, um, get better claim outcomes, or improve efficiencies. So uh, looking forward to talking to you today. Fantastic. Well, look, it's good to see all of you. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules to be here, because I know that you're very, very busy people. Now, OK, remember the golden rule of thumb. We don't want this to be a one-sided conversation. It's the chance for you, our audience, to get involved as well. So use the app to send any questions, comments, observations to the panel, and we'll try to deal with them towards the end of the discussion. So guys, are you all ready? They are. Yeah. We'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Silence means yes. That's acquiescence. OK, so look, let's kick off by asking why is claims automation a huge priority for carriers in 2022? Well, not just for this year, but beyond, given the technology. Laurie, can I start first with you and then move it along the other members of the panel? Sure. I think there's a couple of reasons for it. First and foremost, we all know customer expectations have changed considerably. So I think I've heard that in multiple um, sessions. I'm not saying anything new. But we're really trying to keep up with the expectations that our customers have had in other areas of their life. The other thing that I think has um, caused that, there's two other things. Another one is we're all, um, many of us, maybe not all, many of us are under constraints around um, you know, financial. So how can we do more with less? Um, how can we become more efficient? And um, the third, I think, really comes down to the environment we find ourselves in today with the great resignation that's currently happening and all the changes with our staff and people leaving, people moving, and a lot of vacancies. So I think all of, I think those things had figured in, and then you layer COVID on top of it, and we all realized literally overnight that we had a lot of processes that were difficult to reenact in a remote situation, remote environment. So um, I think all of those things have really played together and have accelerated the need for automation. Okay, Benku. Uh, so I concur with what Laurie said. Um, I think um, a, a big driver is, is client experience. And by client, I mean both the customer experience and our own claim handlers as well, who want to have um, you know, not, not as much of the tedious processes <laughs> what they deal with today. Um, the other aspects are um, that automation has brings opportunity for efficiency in the process, and there's cost reduction that, that's associated with that. I think that's a big driver. Um, and the third one is that um, you know, when, when, when you close a claim fa faster, there are studies that show that you actually pay less. And so it, uh, you know, it, it, it applies to the bottom line loss ratio as well. So I think those are the three big drivers. Okay, Shyam, you were nodding your head in agreement, so I don't think we're going to get any deviation, <laughs> no, really, no, are we? No, no, absolutely. I was going to say the same thing. You know, I also concur with Benku here. Absolutely right. So automation can have many benefits. But, you know, the most impact where I see making, you know, uh, especially in improving the experience, like Benku said, you know, so not only customer experience, because we hear that so often, but I think we also should talk about, you know, the partners, the brokers, or employees. So insurance companies, traditionally, they have been differentiating based on the products, you know, stability, uh, the pricing, and they will still remain at the core. I mean, they're not going away. But I think this is an opportunity for insurance companies to you know, use experience as a differentiator from others. Like how easy it's going to be for them to do business you know, with their partners, how seamlessly they can communicate and collaborate. Right? So all of that you know, is really going to uh, help, I mean. 
But now, if I look at it from the claims lens, you know, like again, taking uh, wearing the hat of a customer, how easily I can report my claims, right? Uh, can uh, there is data pre prefill capabilities? What you provide me? Can you ask me only the relevant questions, right? So just speed up that process absolutely uh, for them. And now, when I look at from the inside, you know, claims adjuster point of view, I think what they are looking at is, you know, do I have all the right data? Mm. Uh, and is this data organized for me enough? Is this, you know, is this giving me all the right insights what I need to make those decisions? So I think, you know, from overall, the experience is going to be much better and automation is going to reduce the friction in this whole process. Okay, so really optimistic forecast there. But Laurie, to what extent does automation provide the answers for a quicker and more efficient claims process? Is it the ultimate panacea? It, it's definitely, um, I don't know that it's the ultimate answer, but I do think that it does, it, it, it really does help smooth out the process. You know, we, um, it was touched on um, as well that by providing automation, you're reducing the manual tasks that adjusters have. And if I have heard anything over the last couple months, as I've gotten out and talked to some of our field employees, it's that. It is all the manual work. It's the those tasks that are very mundane, um, really don't require their level of skill. And it really results in a much better job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I believe, and I, I know many others believe, because I've heard this yesterday in another session, if you have a happy employee, you generally have a happy customer. We all know when we're on the phone or we're talking with someone that can't stand their job, that it's obvious. And so if we really believe that if we can keep our claim handlers happy and satisfied in their job, our customers are going to feel it and it is going to pay off. So that is a big driver for us is to find ways to not only speed up the process and have reduced cycle times, but really to improve the experience of our employees that then pays off to our customers. And I guess it frees them up as well because you use the word mundane and if a lot of time is being taken up on mundane stuff, yes. not necessarily challenging, it contributes to the unhappiness. Exactly. Okay, so look, uh, Shyam, given that, how do you think operational efficiencies can be maximised in the claims process? Because look, if you maximise it, make it smooth, you free up your staff, they can do other things. Yeah, so I, I think this is a re relevant question considering the record inflation and the cost pressures you know, faced by insurance company in, in settling their claims. So typically when we look at operational efficiency, we look at how fast we can complete a task with lower cost. But I think there's another important parameter to it, doing it right the first time. I mean, you have to do it right. You just cannot cut corners in handling your claims and then eventually face you know, bad faith claims. Or you know, try to do it so diligently that you take so much time that now you get penal penalized by state because you, you violated the SLAs. So I think operational efficiency, you know, that's, that's a dilemma I think the insurance companies are facing. Do I choose operational efficiency or you know customer experience, right? Because usually one comes at the at the expense of another. Uh, so I, I think you know insurance companies should not be faced with with this question, and they should be able to get the benefit of both. And and when I just look at the FNOL journey overall, you know, so if I give my customers the flexibility how they can report uh, their claims. Uh, which is, you know, through any channel, any device, any time, you know, that's where we are scoring, they're scoring high in customer satisfaction. At the same time, carriers can benefit, you know, from faster and more efficient loss intake process and also reduce the volume on their call center. And I think there are many use cases for this, like, you know, straight through processing, which we always, you know, discuss a lot. So, yeah, that, the, that's how I think, you know, Mm. We can take care of this. Okay, Penku, come back into the conversation because, look, we can talk about automation. Yeah, it's very great. But, look, we need to focus on the practicalities to make it right. And part of that is getting the, the digital data capture process correct in the first place. No butterfly nets included. So what are the keys to making it work, capturing digital data? Uh, I think part of it is... Um uh, you know, some, the, you know, going back to the, the previous two speakers, the, the, there is um, an, an element that can be solved through IoT and the ability to, you know, digitize data as it as it comes in. 
and I think there's this great opportunity there that, 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 that has to be exploited still. Um, the, but I also want to kind of emphasize that there is data that is sitting in our systems today that we don't effectively use. Um, there's lots of it. Um, and ask yourselves, for example, um, how many companies are able to track the lineage of a claim in real time today? That, that, that information is in, in your systems, but we can't do it. Um, and um, there's, there's lots of content that is sitting that is unstructured content um, that, that, that we also capture today. Um, and extracting that in a form that it can be digitally used for a total digital experience, um, th 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 there's still ways to go. Th that's, that's, what I, that's the way I feel. It's slightly unfair, Laurie, because I, I wanted you to follow up with that. Because look, let, let's <clears throat> trace the journey. Because OK, you've got this data. Let's be fair to you. It's new data that you've, been captured, that you've captured, as opposed to something which has been lying in the system for many decades. How can you take that data, leverage it to actually improve productivity and reduce costs? Presumably, it's going to be a little bit easier precisely because it's new data as opposed to what's already there and has yet to be mined. I, I, what excites me the most about this is changing how we handle claims. So the traditional model of handling claims is, is really kind of diary based. And okay, these are my diaries for the day. This is it. Let me go in. What do I have to do on, on you know, claim X? And I believe that all of this, all of the information that we're getting in now really allows us to focus more on alerts. What are those claims? And manage our claims by alerts. What are those claims that need my attention today and why? And then even within the alerts process, really, what are the most critical alerts? I mean, there might be, um, you know, using, a, using texting as an example. As an adjuster, I might have gotten five texts from um, you know different claimants or on different claims. But using sentiment analysis now, we're even prioritizing within that area of what are those texts that are showing frustration? Um, what are those alerts allowing me to identify claims that have the likelihood of attorney involvement? or um, it, you know, an exposure mi mismatch, that it's a higher exposure than what I have it reserved for. Let me focus on those claims and those claims now rather than the traditional diary model, which ends up being more reactive versus proactive. So not only does that allow the adjuster to use their time more effectively, you're also getting ahead of it and reducing your ultimate loss costs and managing, in many cases, your ALAE. It's, it's, it's interesting because you've actually touched on the question I was going to put to <laughs> Benku. But look, I'm going to ask it anyway, just to get your take on this. Because look, we talk about responding in real time, but what does it actually look like in the claims process? Because the customer may have one perception if it's put to them, but it might not necessarily uh, collate to the reality of, of what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think if we do want to talk about a real-time experience for the customer, I think the back-end process also has to be able to um, be a little more real-time and reactive than, um, or proactive, I should say, than, 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 than what, what we have today. So I think taking on something that, that Laurie talked about, which is to have kind of a notification-driven or an alert-driven mechanism to drive the claims workflow, um, I think will, will, will help. Um, and I also think that it, it is all, it equally, it is about notifying and keeping the, the customer informed in, in kind of that, that real-time model that is, that is also important. Um, and guiding them through the process, telling them exactly where their claim is, what do they do? What do they need to do next? What are the follow-ups? Uh, you know, proactively uh, letting them know on that, uh, maybe through an app, for example, um, is 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 what really what a real-time claim should mm. look like. Okay, then. So let's follow on from that, uh, Cheyenne, because look, I want to focus on NLP and other digital tools. How can they be optimized when you're designing an immediate claims experience? Great question. Yeah, so, so before I think you know, we go to the design step, I think there's a step which should happen before it, which is discovery. 
So you have to start like do the discovery first, then design, and then you automate. Because if you're just directly jumping into designing, you don't know uh, how your current workflows are set up, what is working, what is not. And, and that's where I think tools like kind of process mining can help you gather the data for all the analysis and, and can point out specific bottlenecks, right? What, what are you really facing in, in that process based on the different claim types? Now, when you're going to the next step, which is designing, right? So you have to make sure that you're designing this workflows to address, of course, the challenges, what we have found in the discovery, but also can this handle the future processes as well? Because there will be ongoing changes, you know, uh, you know as the company grows or expands. So that's, that's another thing. And I think, again, there are other tools like, you know, low core automation, uh, which can be used, case management, which basically provides that enterprise orchestration. It brings the flexibility, speed, scalability to optimize your current, current and, and future workflows. And finally, now you come to that stage where you decide, okay, I have figured these two things out. Now, how, what tools can I pick up for automation, right? And there are, we talked about AI several times, you know, in, in the last two days, of course, you know, you can use AI in so many ways. Uh, you can use it for fraud, you know, uh, detection. You can use it for identifying subra potential. Then we're talking about data as well, that how do I get all the data? And, you know, that's where NLP can, you know, play a role, IDP as well. I mean, there are so many tools out there. So RPA is another one. So now I think based on what you have done, you have to pick the right combination of technology for your specific use case because you just cannot, oh, because I have all of this, so let's try use everything for this claims journey. I mean, you have to make sure what tool is relevant for what mm. claims workflows because they are, it's claims workflows, but again, you know, you can use IDP in the FNOL, right? But then you can use case, case management when you're doing your adjusted assignment segmentation. So I think that's how, you know, you can basically use different tools. Sure, and I want to stay with the theme of usage, Laurie, in terms of AI and NLP. How can they be used to action a transition from human, from the, well, from the digital to the human agent, but in a way that is seamless? I, I think that's the key. We would all agree, um, it's seamless. You, that transition um, can't be clunky, it can't be obvious. These are, especially in the claims process, for the most part, they're pretty emotional situations. I mean, even if it's just a it, you know, fender bender and your car needs to go to the shop, it's annoying to not have your car and having to go through that whole process. So whether it's annoyance or truly, truly traumatic in the case of an injury or, or a serious, serious situation like a house fire, um, so it's really important that that be seamless and allow people to communicate the way they want to be communicated with. I heard something a couple months ago, and it's resonated me on, on an industry panel that I was on, where a gentleman was saying, he, he's like, I have millennials. Obviously, we all keep talking about millennials want to use their phone for everything. And, you know, he's like, but... My son had a car, first time he had a car accident, and he did not want to do it digitally. He wanted to talk to someone he wanted to hear. He had never been through this before. He wanted to hear it from someone. He wanted to talk to someone he wanted to know. So I don't, I think it's really important that there be multiple channels available, and you allow people to pick the channel that works best for them, and when they want to switch, let them switch and not have it be clunky. We've all, I had a scenario last week where it was a very clunky transition from trying to speak to an agent to wanting, hey, you can use this online portal. That was great, but it was so clunky. I hung up and I waited the 10 minutes to get to an, an agent at the airline to, to try to get on a standby because it just didn't work. So I, I think it's really important that you don't leave your customers with that um, negative experience when they're trying to move back and forth, especially when it comes to claims. Okay, a question for all of you, but I, I want to start first with Shyam and then move it around. Is there actually a limit to automation in claims or is this endless? Yeah, again, I think, great question. So I think I would say, right, never say never. Right, because uh, with so much happening in the industry, you know, we never thought that there will be a hybrid workforce, right? Uh, so we always were working 
were designed to work in office, handle claims and to uh, claims end to end, you know, using that particular in that operation model. But that has changed, right? So customer expectations uh, are, are definitely rising. Pr new products are coming up as well. So I think you know uh, there will always be room for enough automation to you know for diff uh, automating different claims workflows. Okay, so yeah. never say never, Ben. Could you agree? I think there are two aspects to this that, that we need to consider. One is the technology aspect of it, right? And the technology aspect of it is advancing very, very fast. Um, you know, there's still some areas where like emotive AI and stuff is still needed and needs to develop, but that will catch up very soon. So I don't think technology is going to be the barrier. I really think the barrier is at the personal level and at the organizational level. And the reason I say that the example that Laurie just gave. Sometimes when you're in a claim situation, you are in a distress situation, and you want to talk to a person, not to a machine. And so there are cases where I, I think you have to look at that and ask where you, you have to deal with those kinds of situations. My house just burned down. I definitely want to be talking to a person, not to a machine. And the other one is organizational, because I think one of the biggest barriers we have to automation today is the fact that the claims processes we have in almost every company was developed manually and to, to work around technology challenges. And you just cannot take that and, and automate it. The process re-engineering has to happen. And I can tell you from personal experience, the places where we have found out that we are still having challenges with automation or automation isn't giving us the benefits that we expected it's because we are up against ma processes that were designed to be manual and have to be re-engineered. Mm, are you organizations to don't re <laughs> by any Organizations <laughs> don't re-engineer quickly. That's, that, that's what I've noticed. Yeah, the elephant in the room, legacy systems, Laurie. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with both these gentlemen with what they had to say, but and I, I would add to that that um, automating a bad process is, and, and someone said this yesterday in, in one of the sessions, right? I, I think he's like, if you have a bad process, you get a bad outcome. He might have used different words, but so I don't totally want to offend anyone. But um, he, uh, I, I, that's absolutely right. And I think that process re-engineering, that process view is really, really important. I think it's uh, is it going to be straight through automation, straight through processing? I, I really think the future is more in that low touch claim handling and having some personal touch, but trying to automate much of the back, back end, the back end processes, the internal processes that the customer doesn't see. So I think it's more low touch versus mm. no touch. Okay. But look, Shyam, I've saved this especially for you because look, we're talking about automation, the, the benefits and perhaps potential downsides, but where does the human fit into all of this? I mean, how does the role of a human develop when he or she, they, they're operating in an increasingly automated world where their practical skills today could potentially be redundant tomorrow? Yeah, so I think there is no replacement for humans, uh, right? Like Laurie said, it's always going to be like no touch claims because claims is a process. It's, you know, where the adjusters needs to interact you know, guide them through the process, help them through through their journey. So I think automation is never going to replace humans. It's just going to make the processes much more better, efficient. We earlier in the conversation we talked about mundane tasks, right? So similarly, I think automation can help make do that task much better, much faster, rather than human uh, do that, giving more room. I think you know for innovation because when humans are doing what they're supposed to do rather than you know, just typing data from one system to other, I think it'll drive more innovation, creativity. So I, yeah, that's where I see the role. I hope you're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, we've got time to take a question from the audience. So again, we're, we're battling against time, but we can squeeze one in. Again, I'm gonna throw it out to all of you, so whoever leaps on it first, I will not stop you. What are your thoughts on validating callers slash users quickly without having to go through so much verification, which takes time, and is not why the caller called and can be a real customer satisfaction issue. Great question, because verification, it's, it's obviously important, but it's also quite off-putting. So I would say that if you're talking about in the context of claims, um, 
you should have the information on that person already, right? Mm -hmm. They're your they insureds. So you should have that, and you should have a way to very quickly uh, to, to, to identify who that person is. Their, 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 their calling number or something might be as good as, as what you need, and, and you should be able to tell who that person is. Um, um, I, I, and I think that this is, again, um, an area where the insurance companies that I've worked for, for see, appear to be lacking, right? Which is, you know, do they do really good master data management on their customer base? No, they don't. So, this, you know, th those, those kinds of capabilities really have to be built up in order to get to that point. Okay, would anyone else like to add to that at all before we close out? <laughs> no, I think he yeah. answered it very Eloquent, well. I eloquently agree. put. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Look, thank you so much for a really informative conversation. Can you please show your appreciation to our panel? They have been absolutely marvellous. Thank you so much. And apologies for mistaking you with Jake. That wasn't deliberate. <laughs> These things happen sometimes, but look, that's great. We've actually covered quite a bit of ground. And let me give you a heads up on what we're going to be doing a little bit later after this session, because what we're going to do is to pivot a slight change of topics. We're just changing the microphones. We should be ready very, very soon. And what we're going to do is leave claims behind, just for the moment on that back burner, to move on to a discussion about the wave of new product and pricing innovation that is taking place in the industry. As I keep on saying, so much is happening in this space. Technology, a huge driver, and it's opening up other challenges and indeed possibilities. So insurance companies really have to position themselves to be across this so that they can actually get out there, do what they have to do, keep the customer satisfied at the end of the day because you don't want to lose them. Retention is a major issue. But the topic that we're going to focus on today, that is big in its own right. And I'm delighted to say that as ever, I am blessed with having some excellent speakers. So can you please welcome them to the stage? First up, Kevin Horvitz, come and join us. <clears throat> See, I'm slapping my thigh to welcome you, but it doesn't have the same resonance I, I heard as it, palms no. coming to you. Oh, that's good, thank you so much. Thank Kevin, you. please take a seat. Can you also extend the welcome to Emilio Figuero? Thank you so much for being here. Did I pronounce your surname correctly, by the way? Somewhat. I was close. Figueroa. Coming out of my misery. <laughs> How shall I refer to you? Figueroa. Figueroa. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. And finally, we have Grant Owens. Please come and join us. I can't get that pronunciation wrong. Grant I was going to say that's, that's uh, It was an easy perfect, one, right? wasn't it? Thank you so much. <laughs> Grant, it's great to see you. Please take a few. Okay, so we're going to start in the usual way with all of you telling our audience what it is that you do and for whom. So, Kevin, can we start first with you, please? Sure thing. So, Kevin Horowitz, uh, Vice President of Innovation at RLI Insurance Company. Uh, RLI is a mid-sized, mostly commercial carrier based out of Peoria, Illinois. Uh, my role is to help our products and functions improve products, uh, processes, services, and uh, their business models. So, that's what I do. Fantastic. Emilio. Emilio Figueroa, Chief Insurance Officer for Foresight. We are the middle market uh, workers' comp MGU, expanding into additional lines. I deal with strategy and innovation across all lines. Great, and Grant. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Owens. I'm the Chief Insurance Product Officer at Openly. Uh, for those who haven't heard of Openly before, we're a tech-enabled um, provider of premium home insurance, ex sold exclusively through independent agents. So a bit of a different bent than most other sort of home insurance providers out there in the space. Uh, my team leads pricing, underwriting, uh, product development, data expansion, and research. Okay, well look, guys, thank you so much for being here. And again, to our audience, you know the drill. You've got the app downloaded. If there are any questions, observations, comments that you want to put to the panel, use it to send it forward, and I will try to get through as many of those questions as we can in the time available. A lot of ground to cover, so Emilio, you've drawn the short straw. But look, what do you regard <laughs> as the key things that we need to consider when we're trying to add real value for customers when you are developing these new propositions? I think first and for, foremost is looking at collaborating with our insurers to see what they consider real value. What are their needs of the industry? What are their needs respectfully? Um, looking at their needs and then being able to grab those requirements and in an agile sense, be able to shift them and bring them to market in a quicker sense. Core systems are antiquated. It's tough to get something out to market quickly. 
average time for a legacy carrier is six to 12 months, or nine to 12 months. Uh, for us, it's six to 12, but that's still not innovative enough. We need to be able to bring the product and the changes dramatically quick, in a quicker sense. Okay, Grant, given that, how do you think insurers can actually balance the simplification of productions and the differentiation of offerings? Yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing there is that they're not mutually exclusive, right? I think a lot of companies will, will say, you know, to, to differentiate their product, they need to add more bells and whistles, right? More optionality, more features. And I think from a consumer perspective, right, to go back to the question that, you know, Emilia was, at, was asked, I, I think a lot of what adds value from a consumer perspective is improving ease of use, right? And that might be from a, from a uh, sales perspective, from a service perspective or a claims perspective, but also being transparent, right? So the more you layer on differentiated options, I think that, that actually sort of decays each of those other options, right? The things that actually do add real value from a consumer perspective. So I think, I guess if, if I were to think about, you know, balancing the two, frankly, I think you can have, you can sort of have the best of both worlds. If you think about simplifying the product, not trying to make it a one size fits all and actually trying to, you know, target a specific niche and saying this is the right product fit for this market that actually does improve the ease of use, that does improve transparency, that does create a differentiated product at the same time. So I think it's, it doesn't have to be either or, I guess, if you approach it from the right customer focus and the right sort of the right way to add value. Okay, but Emilio, the needs of society are changing. We're all aware of that. So given this, how can insurers build flexible products that reflect these changes? Because they, the, the changes are happening all the time. What is standard today is redundant tomorrow. Once again, for me, it's about collaboration and flexibility. Being able to look at the societal changes that are happening. If you look at the pandemic, seeing you know what can we do to, to effectively respond to what the, what the client needs in a quicker sense. What are we doing to mitigate exposure for mental risk, for example, when, in regards to the pandemic? How fast are we integrating these changes within not only our policy or rating structures, but on the way how we're engaging with our customer? Um, we need collaboration. We need quick response to that um, and making sure that we're actually looking at the societal concerns so we can impactfully make a change in a quick sense. I'm glad you mentioned the word engagement there because I want to bring you into the conversation, Kevin, just to look at customer feedback. Why is it so important to you? And above all, how can insurers actually construct effective feedback loops and at the same time work with customers so that ultimately you can innovate your products and serve them? Yeah. So customer feedback is, I mean, it's the most important thing, right? And we all know it. We need to know what our customers want. We can't provide what they want if we don't know what they want. So, you know, we have several different ways to get that customer feedback. It's not easy. It's actually really difficult. Um, we do a few things uh, in a big way. Uh, specifically, we use uh, in-application surveys and in-application chatbots, chats, uh, so that we get that feedback directly from the customer while they're using our product. Uh, that's something that I don't think is that common, but it's been uh, tremendously helpful. Uh, we also do what I call ride-alongs, uh, which I don't know what our marketing folks would think of that, but I call them ride-alongs. So we actually sit there with our customers as they're using our product, ask them questions. Uh, and that's probably the best way you can get customer feedback. We've found uh, problems with our system we didn't know about. The customers were using workarounds. We've found uh, questions that we could eliminate. We've found that our customers sometimes uh, take five minutes to look something up and we can maybe get that for them off uh, third-party data sources. So uh, those kinds of things are how we're getting customer feedback. I think it's, uh, it's been really successful for us. But Grant, in essence, what we're talking about is big data and this big data is actually driving the push towards more tailored, flexible and personal products. So given that trend, do you think that off-the-shelf products could become a thing of the past or is there still room for them in this new landscape? Yeah, it's a very provocative question, and I think sorry, you know, un, un, <laughs> I don't know. I guess unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, right? I, I I think the answer is, you know, it's certainly I guess in my mind, no, right? That that, that you know, off-the-shelf products aren't aren't just going to be uh, you know you know left left to die. I think I think consumers clearly want more tailored products, mm. and they want you know more bespoke pricing. But I but I don't I don't know that that means that there isn't a place in that ecosystem, mm. to use that overused word, to, you know, for products that are a bit more vanilla, if you want sure. to call them that, right? And I think, I think, but that doesn't mean that you can't use big data, to go back to your real question, 
to use big data to tailor the pricing and the features embedded in those more sort of standard products, right? And I think, to me, it's about, you know, I think using, you know, using a lot of the data that Elizabeth was up here talking about on the claim side, right, using some of that data to really refine the way you think about pricing, right? So she talked about it from a claims perspective, but if you think about how that loop works, right, from a product pricing perspective, that, that data is, is just gold, right? Understanding, you know, if a tornado hit, did it hit the roof? Did it hit the, 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 the siding? Did it hit the, the, the you know, the, the, the trees and the landscape? And, and being able to feed that back into way, the way you price, right? So, you know, to me, I think it doesn't necessarily mean that the products themselves are antiquated if they're somewhat standard, but the pricing itself can reflect the big data benefits that you can get. Okay, fair point. And look, Emilio, if you're looking at things from an operational perspective, what is the infra infrastructure that's necessary to create these innovative products that we've been talking about? Because, yeah, you know, we can say we, we need X, Y, Z, but what is the crucible, if you like, that can incubate it, grow it, and put it out there? Well, foundationally, we need a core system that's agile, that has open APIs that can communicate and pull data points quickly, that we need to build data lakes that are properly structured and we have the data and we can use it across the organization. And even if we have a siloed organization, those organization, the silos are talking respectively with each other and they're being able to well, pull the, the same data. When the silos are talking. <laughs> if they can talk. Yeah. <laughs> Fair point, but I mean, Kevin, look, let's look at low code, no code. I mean, how is that, that, that type of software actually influencing product development and above all, the speed to market, getting it out there? Yeah, so I love low code, no code. I think it's a great thing. Uh, there's probably maybe some vendors out here thinking that's great. Um, but anyway, I think it's a, a great solution. What it does is it allows you to iterate your products uh, quicker, change question sets, things like that. Take the customer feedback you've just gotten and then change your, uh, your product uh, to, to coincide with that. But uh, you know, one of the things about low code, no code uh, is that insurance companies are set up uh, as development shops. And historically, we've developed applications. Low code, no code is very different. So when getting into low code, no code, it's important to actually develop the muscle to be able to do low code, no code, or else you have a product that no one in the company really knows how to use effectively. And that's not a good solution either. So it really, there has to be a commitment to it. Mm, fair point as well. And, and look, Grant, how can advanced analytics actually be used to deliver value added services and at the same time, these individualized products? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, you know, to go back to Elizabeth's point, I think on the claim side, right, that you think about services to a consumer, that's really what they're buying into, right, is really on the claim side, that you're buying into a promise that you're there to deliver when they have a loss. And I think, you know, I'm not even going to try to scratch the surface with that because I think Elizabeth did a great job talking about how advanced analytics around imagery data can really, you know, can, can really assist in that process and drive the claims process. But from a, from a sort of product and pricing perspective, you know, one of the questions you asked earlier was around the, you know, the ability to create tailored products that can be flexible for the current environment, right? And we've all, you know, I think, I think everyone's talking about climate change as, as you know, how, how do you embed, um, you know, the, the effects of climate change or some forecasts of climate change. But I think, frankly, what's actually more important right now as we're sitting here is inflation, right? Mm -hmm. Rapid rising inflation not just affects the way we think about it on the, on the insurance side, but it affects consumers too, right? Massive problem around under insurance. And so if, if you think about how we can use advanced analytics to improve the product, right, that also builds something a bit more flexible. To me, it's really, you know, taking, a, taking sort of stripping away some of the basics of, of the way a homeowner's policy, which is near and dear to my heart, but, but sort of the, the, the structure there around coverage A, right? I think that's a really rigid uh, structure in a homeowner's policy. And if you can build a better product that actually looks at the rebuilt cost of the home, right, leverage a lot of advanced analytics, a lot of big data to actually drive a better model, better prediction of the rebuilt cost and make it flexible to account for things like inflation that's happening real time, that, that solves the underinsurance problem on the consumer's perspective. You get rid of the word limit, right, and you care about rebuilt cost. And then frankly, from an insurance perspective, well, if, if, if we think that the house is $500,000 to rebuild, but oh, by the way, inflation and supply chain issues have disrupted that six months later into the policy, it's now, it's now $800,000 to rebuild it, right? That sort of rapidly um, you know, evolving reconstruction cost that's embedded in the product really helps you accomplish that. Yeah. So I, I want to sort of weave those two together because I think that's, they're really, they're really intricately wound together. Yeah, it's a very good weave, in fact, because it touches on the question I was going to put to you. So you've been, you've been very preemptive. But then again, you are an insurance person, so I guess that's part of the job. Because what I was going to ask you about is that ability to add a wide variety of convenient value-added services. 
becoming a major differentiator for customers, perhaps even more so than price, because you've kind of answered it as well. But, and again, Elizabeth touched on it in that presentation, looking at those properties, yeah. the way they've changed, and that big question, are they underinsured? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think consumers are just, they're going to continue to demand more and more of that digital experience, right? Which, which, is, which is, you know, faster, better, more timely, more transparent processes, right? And I think, you know, so to your point, I think yes, right? There is some amount of, you know, value-added services will be very, very critical going forward. But, but your last statement there, sort of more so than price, that's a tough thing to, to peel apart. I think for certain customers, right, price is less of a reason why they might buy a product. But for others, that's not the case. So I think to me, again, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. And if you approach it as such, you're going to be left behind. I think you have to think about either, either focusing on a specific customer base or, you know, tailoring products and offerings for those different customer bases where, you know, those value-added services are important, maybe as important as price. Uh, but also, you know, I think in terms of the way we, we differentiate the, the product itself. Mm. And, and Kevin, when we look at things like personalization and instant services, how do you see new data sources actually transforming the product propositions? Yeah, I, I'd say every time we find a new data source, uh, we are improving a product. So at the base level, you got a data source and it matches up with a question you've asked a consumer in your application you can eliminate questions in the application, which makes, makes your product simpler, redesign your product, and you know, hopefully get more uh, customers. That way make it uh, a better experience for them. Uh, but also, you know, on the uh, value-added service side, if you're able to put a device in a truck uh, and find out you know, how often are they driving and where are they driving and that type of thing, uh, you can make their payment process much easier. You can charge them by the mile usage-based insurance. Uh, if you can put a sensor in someone's home to detect uh, water, then you can change your product to actually have that service uh, to prevent uh, losses, to have a loss control component to it. So I think any time you find a data source, the, the key is to say, okay, what can I do with this data source? How can I make my customer's experience better? How can I make their product better? And oftentimes, how can I create a, a new product, uh, really? So. Uh, I think that's how those data sources play in. Yeah, uh, Emilio, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> I've been saving. I've been saving some of the best till last. But look, I mean, it's the age-old question: To what extent are the insure techs actually driving the product and pricing innovation? The new kids on the block, effectively. I, mean, I, th I think they're changing the way legacy carriers are looking at not only pricing but policy types, policy forms, um, and they're forcing the industry. They're forcing regulators to look at creating sandbox environments where innovative products can come to play um, that will bypass current legislative concerns that we may have. Um, looking at ways to be able to shift. I mean, why, on the homeowner side, why are homeowners being priced on a flat rate basis with a 10 installment period when they can be priced based on the type of risk that's happening in real time based on, on, based on climate? Um, why are respective insurance not being priced in a real-time basis with the usage of telematics in a general sense. Some states allow it, some states don't. We need to be able to shift and move and talk to the regulators. We don't bring the regulators into these conversations. We have to start collaborating with them. Okay, fair point. And Can look, I add one thing to that yes, too real quick? Please I think, do. I think, please it was do. Great, I think it's a great question. I think it's a good, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, if you think about what, you know, what, what might hold back large, you know, incumbent carriers from pursuing innovation or, or, or really developing solutions that actually you know, push the bounds of product development. I think a lot of, it, a lot of times is, you know, having come from a large carrier in the past, is that you're, you're consciously worried about cannibalizing your own portfolio, mm. right? Why, why would you lower the premiums on customers that are already satisfied and, and you know, there, there's a certain amount of demand-based pricing, whether or not, you know, they might not be specifically price optimizing within their pricing structure, but they're thinking about demand-based pricing and how they manage product rollouts and how they think about overall customers. And so when they pursue innovative solutions that generally better match risk and rate and ultimately lower some costs, for them that's actually a, a net loss, right? That's not a gain. And I think if you think about what insured techs are doing, they're in the business of cannibalization, right? Our, our goal is to generally you know, take market share, right? And, and it's not difficult to sell an underpriced insurance policy, but the harder thing to do is to find the real innovation, the real invention, and bring that to market. And I think 
they're in a unique position. We are in a unique position to actually do that. Okay, final question to all of you. So if you could answer it very briefly so that we can squeeze in an audience question or two. A product innovation in ecosystems, that's what we're talking about. How do you see partnerships and collaboration actually helping to create those new insurance products in the future? Can I start first with you, Kevin, and then move it along? Sure thing. So I have a good example of this, actually. Uh, recently, I talked to a provider of NFTs, so the whole crypto world. Uh, non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens, that's right. I've learned that recently. So, uh, But the point is they had problems with authenticity, right? So they don't know for certain whether their product is authentic or not. And they approached us, is there some way we could develop an insurance product for their customer uh, to guarantee the authenticity of, the, of that NFT? Uh, we passed on that, I will say. But... I think that collaboration and that discussion, you know, they understand their industry far better than we do, and we understand insurance better than they do. So those discussions in new industries, I think, leads to creative solutions. And I suspect uh, that some carrier out there is going to create NFT authenticity coverage. Uh, it just won't happen to be RLI this time. <laughs> Emilio. In the blockchain, I assume. <laughs> in, of course. <laughs> um, for us, looking at and you know, it's, I like to advise and mentor different insure techs and seeing what's out there in the world and you know, how they can bring their products to market. And looking at different technologies or, and different products that I haven't, I've never seen. I've been in the industry for 32 years and seeing you know, credit insurance for tax liens or tax insurance. And looking at the different aspects that are coming out, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be here and see the creative ways that individuals are bringing different things that are not legacy-based into the marketplace, which is exciting. Okay, and Grant? Yeah, maybe just a slightly different bent, thinking about sort of distribution, right? And, and you know, we, we sell really through independent agents, and I think they, they're they also sort of, that distribution channel is going through a rapid evolution right now as well, right? And and so that, that you know, Kevin, you talked about getting, you know, customer feedback, right? For us, agents are real customers as well, right? And I think that, you know, they're the ones who are on the front lines, and I think for us, as we think about sort of a, a portal as an ecosystem, right? An agent, we want an agent to spend, you know, a vast portion of their time within our portal. I think for them, it's about how can they, you know, how can they be more efficient? How can they be more transparent? How can they bring, you know, better products to customers that might not be in our offering or any other uh, customer's offering? So for us, it's about sort of joining forces with our distribution channel. And I think that's how we, one, get some feedback, but two, understand real improvements. Fantastic. Okay, let's go on to the audience questions. Some of them have come through. Guys, are you ready? Maybe. Yeah, okay, it's, ready it's a free-for-all, so if you hesitate, I'm going to choose. Don't put me in that situation, please. Can the panel see products based around subscription models or pay-as-you-use taking off, and if so, where? <laughs> yes, absolutely. The answer is yes. I, and I think specifically, I mean, auto, it's already here. Personal auto, it's here. Uh, I think most of the large, largest carriers already have that solution. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we are working on a commercial solution as well as many other uh, insured decks and legacies uh, in the commercial space for usage base. So I think uh, no doubt about it. Subscription based for things like general liability, I think the model is a little less obvious, um, but I think it, it could happen. Okay, would anyone else like to add to that, Grant? I'll just add some, I mean, I, I totally agree with what Kevin said. I think there's a lot of refinement that's required in the current sort of pay-as-you-drive type auto product, right? It's, it's, I think, you know, to Kevin's point, it, it does tailor the price and the, you know, and the coverage to the actual, to the amount of miles you drive or how, how you drove over a period. But that, that creates, can create wild swings, right? And for some customers, maybe that's a good thing. But I think, generally speaking, the, the industry can do a better job actually executing on that, right? So I think it's, to me, the refinement is much more around how we use it and not whether we should use it or not, because the answer is clearly yes. I think it's just finding the right mechanism to deploy it. Okay, Emilio, would you, would you like to add to that? Sure, I think on the small business, it's readily available, it's there, we're using it. Um, you know, pay as your work, pay as you have liability, you have workers' comp on the commercial side. Um, I think on the middle market side, it's a little tougher, but I think it's moving to that direction. Okay, then. One more question before we close out. Curious to hear the panel's thoughts on the move to predict and prevent models. How does this shift impact the way we design and think about products? Would you like to have a go at that first, Grant, or would you like to pass it along to somebody else whilst you collect your thoughts? Emilio. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to talk about this. Uh, we're looking at predictive models for underwriting right now. We're looking at benchmarking with different consortium data sets, but looking at future 
models to see sentiment analysis within underwriting, how why underwriters are making specific decisions when they hit when they have the same data sets. What is causing that decision? Is it a socio-geographic uh, concern that's making them make a, a different change? So for us, looking at those predictive models, looking at predictive claims, looking at you know, how clients are responding to engagement levels um, within risk mitigation technologies, so that we can predict what their losses are going to be. So it's very exciting. Okay, fantastic. Would you care to sure, add to that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think more how to how to couch my um, you know cynical nature here. I'm an actuary by background, so naturally a cynic, but I think sort of the, the, your question was around, or the, the question was around sort of predict and prevent type implementations or models or products, right? And I think, you know, to me, it, it comes down to sort of fundamentally, can you change an insured's behavior when you think about the sort of prevention, right? So some of it might be through devices and, and maybe that has some value add. Uh, it might reduce severity. It's not gonna, in theory, reduce frequency, but it might help you manage overall costs. On the auto side, same thing, right? If you get into UBI or telematics, with the sole intention of changing the way your customers drive, you are only fooling yourself. I, I think that that is, that is maybe a small sliver of why you might get some value out of it, but ultimately you get better data to make better predictions. So to me, it really, that you should always rest your laurels on the predict side and use the prevent side as complementary or supplementary. Okay, Kevin, last word? Yeah, I mean, predictive models, we use them all over the place. Uh, we've dabbled in the claim space to try to predict which claims are gonna jump. Uh, on the underwriting side, you know, predictive models, what makes a good risk. We have tons of data at insurance companies. We've historically been okay at using it. Um, and I think there's a, a real push to, to use it better uh, and to, you know, use modeling to, to select our risks in a better way. Okay, gentlemen, there we will have to leave it. But if you could show your appreciation for a great discussion, thank you so much. Thank you.